uh, which will be given by Leroy Hood, with the title After the Human Genome Project, Systems Biology and Predictive, Preventive, and Personalized Medicine. Leroy Hood was born in Missoula, Montana in 1938. He has had and has a truly amazing scientific career in the fields of molecular biology and biotechnology, and now in systems biology, a field he helped to define. He authored over 600 peer-reviewed papers and numerous books, received a dozen patents, and started 10 biotech companies, and a few years ago created the Institute for Systems Biology, which already has over 170 people on its staff. Dr. Hood has been associated with Caltech during much of his life, 30 years. He earned his BS in biology there in 1960, and later his PhD in biochemistry at Caltech in 1968. The fastest track was in the way to spend eight years, a long time for a PhD, but you have to understand that he went to Johns Hopkins and earned an MD during that same period. Later he returned to Caltech where he was on the faculty from 1970 to 1992, including a decade as director of the Cancer Center. At Caltech, he and his colleagues created several of the core instruments of modern molecular biology. In particular, his DNA sequencer, which was prototyped in 1985, made a human genome project feasible. Indeed, Dr. Hood was one of the early proponents and strongest proponents of the human genome project and a key player throughout that one of the most important scientific projects of our time. In 1992, Dr. Hood moved to the University of Washington in Seattle, where he was the William Gates III Professor of Biomedical Science, and he created the Interdisciplinary Department of Molecular Biotechnology. In 2000, he co-founded the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle to develop the systems approach to biology and medicine. He currently serves as president of ISD and continues to pursue his interest in biology, medicine, technology, computational biology. Not surprisingly, Lee's work has been widely recognized. He received the Louis Pasteur Award, the Dickinson Prize, the Arthur Glass Pervasive Medical Research Award, the Franz Brody Medal, the National Biotechnology Venture Award, the Kyoto Prize in Advanced Technology in 2002, and this year, the prestigious Levinson MIT Prize for Invention and Innovation. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Association of Arts and Sciences, and holds nine honorary degrees. I'm director of the Institute for Mathematics and its Application, which is the sponsor of this lecture. The mission of the IMA is to support interdisciplinary research, which involves mathematical ideas and mathematical researchers and the attacks on important problems. This year, our theme is probability and statistics in complex systems with a full order devoted to the study of the genome of one of the complex systems. The quarter, in fact, started today, both, uh, both the scientific program and this public program, and it's hard to imagine a more exciting or appropriate speaker for our first public lecture than we invite up. Well, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, that gracious introduction. Biology is at an inflection point. Uh, it is uh, something that happens rarely in disciplines, but in part because of the Human Genome Project, as we look forward to biology and medicine, uh, we realize it's never going to be the same again. And what I'd like to do is give you some sense of the nature of this dramatic change uh, and the implications it has for biology in the future. And I would say the two are, are captured in the title I've given, uh, the idea of uh, being able to approach the study of biology uh, with systems approaches and, and this profound transformation medicine will take over the next 15 uh, to 20 years toward a predictive uh, preventive and a personalized uh, medicine. I thought one very useful way to introduce biology would be uh, in looking back over my career, some of the signal mileposts and, and so forth uh, that, have, um, that have occurred. And I would say that there are really five transitions that I've seen uh, since 1970. Uh, 
one is the grudging, gradual and grudging acceptance of technology development and integration in biology. A second is the Human Genome Project. The third is the consequence of biology becoming cross-disciplinary. And then finally, we'll talk about systems biology and predictive and preventive and personalized medicine. When uh, I went to Caltech in 1970, I told the chairman that I was going to spend half my time developing uh, technology. And that was not uh, a popularly approved uh, point of view at that time. And in fact, three years later, the chairman came in and argued that I should give up this technology stuff and focus only on the, on the biology. And I said, well, I really decided I was going to do this, so I, I should. And I asked him, uh, uh, 20 years later why he said that because I got tenure very shortly after that period of time so it wasn't an issue of tenure and he said it was because all of the senior faculty in biology felt it was inappropriate and unseemly that technology development should be done in biology but if you wanted to do it you really should go to engineering and that in fact was the very reason I left Caltech uh, almost uh, uh, 20 years later now, the point of view I had about technology development was that biology should drive it. So the simple idea is that there are frontiers in biology, and those should be what you should direct your technology at. Because once you create a new technology, then you have the ability to go back and uh, clear the shrouds of those frontiers. And really, in biology, what technology development generally means is being able to decipher biological information more efficiently. And I'll talk in some detail about what I mean by that. The, uh, for a primer for people who know little about biology, there are four major, in a very simplistic sense, four major types of biological information. There's uh, the DNA that forms the uh, core of your chromosomes. Uh, that's a four-letter language. Uh, you have 2.6 billion letters of information in each and every one of your cells. And one of the units of information that's present on chromosomes are genes. And they can be expressed in a differential manner through a re related nu nucleic acid, uh, messenger RNA. Again, it has four basic letters in the language. And it serves, uh, at least in part, as a tool for amplifying particular types of information from individual genes and that can be fed into a specialized factory that then synthesizes the third type of information which is called proteins. Now proteins have 20 letters in their language and because they have greater diversity uh, although they're synthesized as a uh, initially as a linear chain there is a driving propensity for each different protein with its unique combination of letters to fold into a specific individual three-dimensional molecular machine. So the proteins are the molecular machines of life. And what we've come to understand uh, recently is that the proteins and other macromolecules then can assemble together into complex entities called systems and of course the heart is a system, a very complicated system. Uh, the brain is an even more complicated kind of system. So these are four types of biological information uh, that at the very beginning we were interested in being able to decipher. And interestingly enough, the, the five instruments that we developed uh, included the ability to determine the order of the units in a protein, so-called protein sequencer, or to synthesize fragments of proteins uh, or to do the same for DNA, to sequence or determine the order of uh, subunits in a DNA fragment or to synthesize the DNA fragment. And then finally, we, we were one of the first that developed the uh, array technology, these DNA chips that allows you to analyze messenger RNAs. So those instruments uh, essentially let us, in differing ways, look at all four of those types of information. But if one wants to see uh, an instrument that certainly transformed biology, it was the DNA sequencer. We developed this in 1986. And it, the, the idea was a very simple one. We used four different fluorescent dyes to color code the four different letters of the uh, 
uh, DNA uh, language. And we used a laser to read out the color of the different letters on the fragments of DNA as they migrated by in gels. And one was able to essentially, through these color patterns, read off uh, the DNA sequences of a whole series of individual gels. And this uh, quite naturally led in 1985 to my being invited to the first meeting that was ever held on, on the Human Genome Project. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. The Genome Project is basically all about the DNA that's present in the nucleus, the, the uh, center of uh, each of the cells. You, you, a human organism has somewhere between 10 to the 13th and 10 to the 14th different cells. And uh, the DNA is that digital information that basically encodes life. And in humans, there are 24 different types of chromosomes present as uh, 23 pairs. The sex chromosomes X and Y are different from one another. And as I said, this is about 2.6 billion letters of the DNA language. So the objective, uh, the simple objective of the Human Genome Project then was to determine the order of the letters uh, in these chromosomes, uh, which, uh, whose fundamental cores were uh, DNA strings. Uh, for all 24 of these human chromosomes. And it was, it was really quite a monumental task. Now, Bob Sinsheimer, who was uh, Chancellor of Santa Cruz in 1985, spring of 1985, called a meeting on, uh, the first meeting ever on the, the Human Genome Project and invited 12 people that were geneticists and technologists and molecular biologists and uh, and the like, and the meeting was really an interesting one. The general conclusions that came from that meeting were number one, that the Human Genome Project was really feasible, although an enormous amount of technology development remained to be done on the DNA sequencer at that point in time. And number two, uh, the group was split six to six quite evenly on whether or not to recommend the project. And those that were opposed were quite bitterly opposed, and I'll say more about that in uh, just a moment. What I found particularly exciting about the Human Genome Project was the idea that it was going to open biology up in really a new way. It, it was one of the first that pushed something I call discovery science, at least at the molecular level, and that is the idea that you can take a complex ob object like the genome and you can define it in, it, in its entirety. That is, you can sequence uh, the entire genome. And because that would contain all the genes that were present in a human being, for the first time we could think about doing global analyses. That is, we could do analyses where we interrogated how every gene behaved in response to a particular type of perturbation. And that was the reason why we developed the DNA chips, as a matter of fact. And the second thing that was clear to me is that the technology was really going to have to be pushed, uh, not only the DNA sequencer, but many other instruments that have uh, come along at that time. And it was obvious that it was going to transform biology and medicine in ways that we'll, uh, we'll talk about. Now, I will say that in 1985 through 88 or so, probably 90% of the biologists were bitterly opposed to the Human Genome Project. And they were opposed, I think, basically because they were afraid it was big science, it would take money from small science, and I think many were convinced that it would contribute little if any to, to real biology. And it was the first time I ever realized how biased and incapable of thinking logically scientists could be. And in fact, it wasn't until 88 when there was a National Academy committee set up to look into the Genome Project, and, and the leader, Bruce Alberts, was firmly opposed to it, as were about half of the members. And uh, a year and a half later, it came out with an enthusiastic, unanimous endorsement of the Genome Project. And it was a testimony to, if you sat down and reasoned it through, that it was a pretty uh, kind of compelling argument. Well, the Genome Project, uh, in fact, did get done. Uh, it was officially finished uh, earlier this year. One of the surprises is that there are only about 30,000 or so genes present in the human. And I think there are 
real parentheses around the number of genes for a variety of really interesting technical reasons, but this is what most people will tell you. Because we did the genomes of many uh, model organisms, uh, it gave compelling evidence of, of what Darwinian evolution had long since concluded. We all came from a single common ancestor. And I think there were two things that were really remarkably interesting. One was the idea that there is lateral gene transfer, that is genes from other organisms can be transferred into another organism, and those genes can be integrated in and used. So the idea of classical evolution, where you get your genes by natural descent, by evolutionary descent, was wrong in interesting ways. And, and in fact, the early claims were that humans had more than 200 such laterally uh, transferred genes. So God has actually been playing with genetic engineering for some time. Where lateral uh, gene transfer really makes a difference is in microbial organisms. And the final point that was really fascinating is when you looked at the genomes of different races, it was remarkable that there were very, very few race specific uh, sequences. And I'll talk about kind of the sociological implications of that a little bit uh, later in the lecture. Now, what was really interesting from my point of view is when we developed the DNA sequencer, it, it required me to bring into my lab not only the biologists we had, but chemists and engineers, uh, and even people that were doing computer science before we could put together the technical skill uh, in, in fact, what was really interesting is we tried for about three years a wrong way of going about building the DNA sequencer, and it was only when we got this talent together that we really realized the combination of things that was absolutely necessary. And that's when I first realized how important it was going to be to create a cross-disciplinary environment uh, in biology. So I went to the president of Caltech and argued that what we really ought to have is a second department of biology, one I wanted to call molecular biotechnology, where we'd bring in physicists and chemists and computer scientists and uh, mathematicians and engineers as well as biologists, and they could work together on the technological, the computational, as well as the biological problems that were going to be coming out of the Genome Project. and. Um, Caltech, like a lot of really good places, had this very interesting dichotomy. So the chemists, the engineers, and the physicists thought that was a great idea. The biologists vetoed it. And I think it was kind of a threat that they didn't want to have another department that had, again, the same very different uh, engineering character. So I moved in 92 to the University of Washington and set up this Department of Molecular Biotechnology and it really pioneered a whole series of technologies in a remarkably short period of time. It really started the field of proteomics, that is the global analysis of proteins. We developed the really key software for the Human Genome Project and, uh, and actually gave rise to two of the 16 human genome centers that were present in the United States along with a lot of other things. But it was then that I realized having a really strong focus on the technology had to be complemented and driven by really good biology. And that's where I started thinking seriously about systems biology. And then in, in the year 2000, set up the Institute for Systems Biology. And one of the dictums that I've really been intrigued with in my career is the idea that really new ideas require new organizational structures. It's very hard to impose dramatic new ideas on old architectures of administrative structures. And I've seen that three different times in my career now. So what exactly is systems biology? Well, one simple way we can think about it is suppose you want to under, understand how the healthcare system worked. One idea would be you'd look at patients and their relationships to the other components in the healthcare system, doctors and hospitals and insurance companies and so forth, but in fact you'd have to look at the interrelationship of all of those elements one to another. And exactly the same is true in systems biology. We can look at the relationship of DNA to the other informational components that are present in biology, 
but we have to look at all of their different interrelationships in the end integrate them together so that we can really understand them well. Now, one of the things that I've been charged with doing in this lecture is giving uh, mathematicians an idea about what I think are some of the frontier problems in biology. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about biology as an informational science than I would ordinarily do uh, to a general audience so we can set a context for, uh, for thinking about um, mathematical and computational problems. There, there are really two general types of biological information. One is the digital information that's encoded in the genome. And that digital information in the genome actually makes biology unique among all of the disciplines because digital information is ultimately knowable. So in biology, we start with a core of certainty about the nature of the information that begins things. And that isn't true uh, in any of the other disciplines. And the second point is, uh, the second type of information are the environmental cues that impinge on this digital information. And uh, we could talk about determinism and stochastic kinds of environmental cues, but they, they, they are many and diverse. And how you interrelate these two types of information is the real challenge in biology. And, Indeed, the real challenge is how you relate them across the tr three time dimensions of life. So evolution uh, takes a long time. Development takes some significant fraction of the lifetime of the individual, whereas physiology can, can happen uh, in milliseconds. So what are the kinds of systems that operate across those three very, very different time dimensions? And we probably won't have time to go into it, but I'll tell you the systems are quite different in, in uh, principle and in, uh, in architecture. So if we ask a question uh, about digital information, how many types of digital information are present in the chromosomes, the answer is two. So one type of information are the um, genes that encode the proteins. And again, the proteins make complicated molecular machines. And, this is one such complicated molecular machine that's constructed of about uh, 30 uh, different proteins. And proteins can interact individually. They can interact in clusters, as we see here. Or they can interact in networks in really interesting ways. And here's an example of a protein network that's been uh, delineated in, uh, in the yeast cell. Now, the second type of information is the information that regulates how protein, uh, proteins behave. And it's called uh, the gene regulatory networks. And the basic components of gene regulatory networks are the machinery for each individual gene that specifies the rate and timing and uh, uh, space in which a particular gene is transcribed. And the basic components are other proteins called transcription factors that interact with control elements, these little purple things here, uh, collectively to make a very complicated molecular machine that operates on another machine that transcribes the RNA. And it's the interaction of these elements with this machine that gives the system's properties to the expression of each individual gene when in time, where in space, and the amplitude with which it's expressed. But the really key thing to remember in gene regulatory networks is the networks are specified by these DNA elements that bind the transcription factors because they establish uh, the layering and the architecture of the gene regulatory network that carries out the various, uh, the various functions. So the digital, the second type of digital information are these gene elements that determine the nature and shape of uh, gene regulatory networks. And I'll just say that in a sense, you can think about a gene regulatory network, whether it be development or whether it be physiology, as a central processor. And there are protein networks that feed information into that. And the central processor in turn feeds information into yet other protein networks that carry out the functions of development. So 
how these different networks are integrated together and combined is one of the central problems in contemporary biology. And the final point I'll make about biological information is that it uh, is manifest at many different hierarchical levels, DNA to message to proteins, to proteins that interact in these protein and gene networks and the cells and so forth. And the really important point is if you're, well, there are two important points. One is at each successively higher level of information, environmental cues impinge on that original digital core of information and change it. And they change it in very profound ways. Hence, if you're to understand systems, you have to be able to capture as many of these different types of information as possible and integrate them all together. That's the simple take-home lesson. And that's the essence of really what systems biology is about. So I thought what would be useful in talking about systems biology would be describe how we view our mission uh, at the Institute for Systems Biology and just give you a feel for what we actually think it is. So one thing uh, is to pioneer uh, this approach towards systems biology and the way we've done it is to begin with very simple cells and uh, systems in bacteria and yeast and this is a system that's present in yeast and we initially studied this collection of genes that metabolize a certain kind of sugar but in doing two things one studying all of the genes and all of the proteins we were able to integrate together information which sharply defined the system we were interested in and defined brand new relationships in that system and even more defined the relation of this system to many other systems that are present uh, in the yeast cell and this was uh, and, and the important point, take home point was in nine months we did far more than the equivalent about, of about 30 years of classic molecular biology using one gene and one protein at a time approaches. So it gives you uh, an, an idea about the acceleration of systems biology. And the essence of systems biology, which is hypothesis driven and global and quantitative and integrative and, and iterative is one, if you've done it right, and ultimately what we'd really like is to have mathematical descriptions of all of these systems integrated together, uh, we ought to be able to predict the behavior of the system given any perturbation, and we actually ought to be able to redesign the system to have new emergent or systems properties. And we've done this with some of the systems I'm not going to talk about already. A second mission is to develop new kinds of global technologies. And one technology that we're working on now is a completely new way of sequencing DNA using single molecules of DNA in the tools of nanotechnology, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. And it's my prediction in the next 10 to 15 years that we'll be able to sequence an entire human genome in a half hour for less than $1,000 um, um, uh, using these new approaches to, to analysis. And that's going to mean that we can sequence, well, let's get back there, that we can sequence uh, many, many different genomes from different organisms, but it's going to allow us to sequence human genomes, and this is going to be the basis for predictive medicine, something I'm going to talk about uh, later on. Now, the, the grand challenges then that come out of this is if we have thousands of genomes, how can we computationally or mathematically identify the genes and these regulatory elements that I've talked about that is beginning to decipher the logic of life? And what I will emphasize is one can't do the mathematics of these challenges unless you understand the biology in a very deep way because the two are really uh, intertwined one with another. A second point is by comparing, doing all by all comparisons against all of these genomes, we can see regions that are conserved, those contain information. Some of that information are genes and regulatory elements, but others, uh, other kinds of information will emerge as well. And 
these comparative genomics is going to be an incredibly important area. And from this information, we'll begin to construct for individual organisms uh, the networks of, of life. And of course, then we'll be in a position to begin comparing these regulatory networks and see how the logic of life changes. And what I will say is the evolutionary rules for gene regulatory networks are strikingly different than they are for proteins. Gene regulatory networks can evolve very, very quickly compared to uh, most protein evolution. Now, another area that we're very interested in at the Institute is um, proteomics. And some have argued there are a million to a million and a half proteins per cell. So how do you identify them or quanti quantify the different proteins? Or proteins can be modified chemically by 400 different uh, types of, of modifications and uh, measure the interaction, the half-life. How, how can we do all of these kinds of things? So we actually have developed a series of technologies that have been very effective uh, to begin with in these first two areas. And of course, the three-dimensional structure of proteins is really critical uh, to assigning their function. And I would say that's another of the grand challenges for, for uh, um, computer science and mathematics. How do we, how do you carry out the protein folding problem? Uh, IBM a few years ago said, well, we'll do it by building Blue Gene, this big giant supercomputer. And of course, that was utter nonsense because protein shape space is infinite. So you, there's no way you can search all of shape space. So you have to do your searches informed by the constraints of real protein structure. So how do you do that? That's an enormously interesting mathematical challenge and one that we are uh, very interested in at the Institute. Now, if there's any technique that I think is going to transform biology, I think it is going to be uh, uh, nanotechnology and, and uh, microfluidics. And about a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, we set up a collaboration with uh, Caltech and UCLA, three physicists uh, and a chemist, um, who, who were driven by one simple idea. Jim Heath, who's a really terrific nanotechnologist, heard me give a lecture at UCLA and came up afterwards and said, I didn't understand much of what you had to say about systems biology, but I did understand your argument that you had to use the biology to drive the development of technologies. So he said, what would you like to see in a nanochip? So we spent kind of the next year beginning to design a nanochip that could make five different kinds of measurements. So one was that we could actually take cells and place them on nanopores, individual cells on nanopores, and then ac access them either uh, electrically or optically and interrogate how that individual cell behaved in assays. That is, when you perturbed it phenotypically. And then the second point was that we would be able to dissolve the membrane of that cell and deposit the contents of that cell on nanowires which had individually been functionalized to look at individual protein molecules or individual RNA molecules and of course have in principle have the sensitivity to detect single molecular interactions. So you could get concentrations of protein and RNA molecules. And finally, uh, we wanted to be able to deliver the contents of these cells to, to nanocantilevers where we'd have uh, ligands or interacting protein partners there so that we could very precisely measure protein, protein, and protein DNA uh, interactions. And we've done the first of these five assays. That's working very nicely now, at least for a certain subset of cells. And we suspect it's going to take of the order of five years or so to accomplish the, uh, the other assays. A third area is to create the tools we need from the uh, quantitative sciences. And of course, uh, in a straightforward way, one of the things that we need is to be able to take these large global data sets that we get, RNA or protein, or metabolites and put them in a database uh, 
and then be able to interrogate the literature with regard to what is known about each of the individual elements. And finally, we're developing a tool called Cytoscape that is a graphical uh, interface that gives us the ability to integrate together a multiplicity of different types of biological data. Uh, the concentrations of proteins and RNA molecules, the interactions of proteins and DNA molecules and a variety of other things. And it's this cytoscape that gave us that first insight into the yeast cell that I mentioned later. And of course, we want to be able to push our understanding of individual systems to the point that we can write detailed logical diagrams and even uh, represent them uh, mathematically. Now, what I haven't emphasized up till now, but it is the essence of systems biology, uh, namely, all systems are dynamic in nature and what you need to be able to understand is how they change dynamically across developmental time or across physiologic time. So a key question is how can you take a multiplicity of snapshots of their information and once you've done that, how do you integrate it together in a way that you can understand even graphically to begin, to begin with? And I will say those are problems that we really haven't solved very well. So how do we capture, and this is really important, validate large data sets. There is enormous, there are enormous signal to noise problems in large data sets. And most of the data sets that are out there, some of them have error rates that are in excess of 50%. So how can you deal with the, the validation and the capture of these large data sets? And then once you have these very different types of data, how do you integrate them together and display them uh, so that we can kind of understand something about the nature of the systems that we're, that we're really interested in? A point I like to make is that there is going to be, a, I think, a really interesting convergence in, in information technologies and biotechnology in that at their part both employ a digital language and for example, if we just take deciphering gene regulatory networks, I think they are going to give us fundamental new insights into how one can integrate in a digital manner enormous amounts of information and parse it out in really effective ways. And that is to say, I think there are going to be really interesting opportunities for taking the logic that four billion years of evolution has developed as life has evolved and, and applying it to, to IT and so forth. The idea that we have to integrate the biology and the medicine, technology and quantitation is, is really absolutely central to everything that we're talking about. And that, of course, means we need these cross-disciplinary uh, technologists, uh, but what I would really emphasize is unless the cross-disciplinary scientists understand biology in a deep way, they are nothing more than technicians. They can't contribute in a fundamental way to, to moving the field forward. So one of the questions is, what's the most efficient way for understanding biology in a deep sense? And I think it is through doing it in this informational sense that I've tried to talk about here. So uh, there is a question of how you bring the cross-disciplinary fa faculty a common language, and it goes both ways. The biologists have to learn about the tools of uh, engineering, physical sciences, and, and quantitative sciences. Um, how do we get the deep insights? But systems biology is really hard, and I really think that institutes like ours anyway have to focus. And getting academics to focus is a really interesting exercise in uh, cha sea change and in, in attitudes and things. But uh, we're succeeding in doing it. How do you take the new technologies and put them into high throughput platforms? Or how do you capture all these levels of information and integrate it together and graphically display it? And ultimately, we'd like to be able to describe it uh, all mathematically. And of course, one of the big questions, that, which was the same as with the genome, how do you integrate the, the, the systems biology, this integrative kind of science I've talked about, 
with small science. That that is a really important challenge. And I, I will say that we have done it at the Institute for Systems Biology by lots of academic collaborations. We have uh, probably 50 academic collaborations. We have uh, 10 major industrial collaborations. And I think partnerships are really key in, again, a field that's moving so rapidly and requires so much from the technological, the quantitative, and the uh, biological side. So how can we integrate and display these protein and gene regulatory networks? That is, how do they interact in a cohesive and integrated fashion? And how can you convert them then into models and ultimately mathematical descriptions? And that's what we need really to formalize this, uh, this logic of life. Now, the final mission we have is to develop the technologic and quantitative formulations to do this predictive, preventive, and personalized medicine. So let me tell you a little bit about how I see that. This is um, uh, uh, Will Chamberlain and Willie Shoemaker, and the genes almost certainly are responsible for this enormous difference in height. And in fact, what's interesting is the most common kind of variation among humans is just a single letter of the DNA language. These are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Polymorphism stands for variation. What is really striking is that uh, there, is, there are about, across individuals, roughly six million variations that on average separate us one from another. Most of them make no difference whatsoever, but if you give us uh, differences in, in physiology and a few others give us uh, this disease predisposition. So before I talk about predictive and preventive medicine, you should understand that disease comes from two simple origins. One is it's genetic and of course uh, the genes can be either inherited, defective genes can be inherited, or they can mutate during your lifetime and in fact that's the most common uh, cause of cancer, as many of you know. And of course, the second uh, um, uh, uh, cue for disease are pathologic environmental cues, infectious organi organisms and, and, uh, and uh, the like or examples there. So predictive and preventive medicine has to be able to handle both types of uh, diseases. So how do we go about thinking about that? Well. Uh, my prediction again is within the next 10 to 15 years we will firmly have the basis for predictive medicine. So my prediction is that everyone will have their genome sequenced and will be able to correlate your 30,000 or so genes and variations therein with a predisposition, a probabilistic statement about what diseases you're likely to get in the future. So we can hand this out to you and you can know what the likely outcome is. And of course, what you'd like, what you need to do as well is to be able to not only follow the potential consequences of your probabilistic health history, but to be able to look at um, environmental uh, disease cues as well. And hence, uh, biannual multi-parameter blood measurements are really going to be important. And the simple idea here is that we will be able to look at proteins and bloods, as I'll show, uh, proteins and uh, messenger RNAs in the blood, and from measuring uh, 10,000 of them or more, we will be able to distinguish between health and disease in very powerful ways. And the idea is that uh, an individual uh, protein or RNA falls within certain levels if you're normal, but then it moves out of these levels uh, when you move into a disease state. So this, in fact, is going to be uh, an instantaneous predictor of health status. And in fact, my prediction is within seven years, we'll have a little handheld microfluidics device that can prick your thumb and take a small amount of blood and make the measurements, and you can put those into the internet, and it'll fire you back. Uh, you're fine, do it again in six months, or it'll say, uh, go see your cardiologist, there are things that you should uh, check out. Now, we have started to do a number of experiments to show that this really is going to work. Uh, 
And this is one of the first set of experiments. So here is an experiment where we've, we've looked at a thousand proteins present in the blood. Uh, the green mice here are those that have a certain type of skin cancer, and the red mice are those that, have, uh, that are normal individuals. And what you can see that is so striking is of the thousand proteins we looked at, about a hundred of them are essentially absolutely diagnostic for whether you have this particular type of cancer or not. So this is going to be uh, the basis for a new diagnostics company that the Institute is in the process of setting up. But more than that, one will be able to do this same thing for infectious disease, for genetically inherited disease, as well as cancer. And we have other experiments ongoing in uh, all of these different areas. So a real mathematical challenge is if we have uh, 200,000 human genome sequences, how do we co correlate the variations in the 30,000 human uh, genes with diseases and issues of uh, signal to noise are going to be absolutely staggering there. As in the second one, how do you correlate these uh, multiple blood parameters with health and disease? And I'm very attracted to the idea of, of um, using, um, after appropriate selection of signal, uh, kind of an n-dimensional space to characterize healthy states from disease states, because it seems to me there could be enormous sensitivity there. How do you do that? Uh, we have no idea at this particular point in time. The design of preventive measures is going to come via the systems approaches. So this is the network I showed you in the yeast cell before. And to give you a little bit more information, this little red dot is the same as if this key protein in this little hub of a network were knocked out by a drug. And when it's knocked out by that drug, and you see the white indicates the genes have lost their function, but the drug not, knocked out only, not only um, genes or proteins in the system, but if you look around the other systems, you can see white genes as well. So the drug has a lot of different side effects. And the important point is with these systems approaches, we have good assays for all of these side effects and we can redesign the drugs so we can eliminate at least the worst of these side effects and optimize on the, the effect that you want. So what I'm predicting is systems biology is going to revolutionize drug discovery and what I will predict is the pharmaceutical industry will be utterly incapable of coming to grips with systems biology because of all the integrations that it requires. So I think pharma, the whole pharma industry is going to be dramatically reshaped in the next 10 to 15 years and there'll be an opportunity for really interesting new companies to do this uh, kind of systems biology. Now, the final point of course, personalized medicine, because each of us differs by six million nucleotides from one another, we're gonna be predisposed to different diseases, hence we have to be treated individually. But another prediction is that in 20 years, I think we'll have extended the productive lifespan of most individuals by 10 to 20 years. And I really emphasize the productive lifespan by avoiding uh, a lot of these late onset diseases. And of course, that has really interesting implications for society. If you can be creative and energetic in your 70s or your 80s or your 90s, we have to rethink Social Security and retirement and health insurance and a lot of other things. Uh, we don't treat older people very well right now. The physicians we're training today are going to be practicing a very different type of medicine. I'm giving a lecture in a couple of days at Emory on how medical training has to be totally revamped over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And it is really going to be a dramatic change from what we do now. And I predict most med schools are going to have a lot of trouble with that. And how do you educate society for a very different kind of medicine? And the social, ethical, legal challenges I think are obvious. Privacy, uh, issues of effective genetic counseling, uh, issues of germline engineering that are going to come because we 
understand systems better and better and uh, genes that control behavior uh, and uh, so forth. There are a whole series of these, these issues that I think are non-trivial. And as I go around and talk to people, there is uh, uh, an enormous amount of ignorance about these kind of issues and about the ability to think of them very deeply. And I'm worried in two ways. Uh, I think we have to distinguish the discovery and the application phases of science. And if you take something like stem cell research now, you see that the present administration has totally confused these issues. They, it's, uh, they want to ban it strictly on religious uh, terms. And the arguments that embryonic stem cells are no different from adult stem cells are utter nonsense. Okay, I mean, anybody who is in the field, with a few exceptions that have doctrinaire points of view, I think would agree with that. My feeling is uh, scientists ought to have a real uh, responsibility to educate society about science. And the way we've been doing it for about the last uh, eight years now is K through 12 science education. And what we've done is set up an approach that's inquiry based. We do it through professional teacher training, and we do it, as you'll see in a moment, through systemic reform. And the, the really key point is you want students to go out and become citizens that can think analytically, can think about opportunities and challenges of these new technologies, and maybe a few of them might even become scientists. But to give you uh, the dimensions of what we've done, we've, the Seattle School District has 72 schools, 1,100 teachers, 23,000 students, and we've, we've had a program going there now for about seven years that I think is one of the best in the, in the country, and more recently we've done the same with middle school, and we can take in more school districts because there are uh, fewer teachers because the teachers specialize as you get higher. And again, we, we plan to do the same thing for high school, but I think having scientists be committed to this kind of thing and educating the public as we move uh, into these dramatic advances in technology. Biotech is one. There are obviously many, many others that one can think of. So I would argue that, that the missions of an academic should extend well beyond scholarship and education. I think we have a real obligation to transfer knowledge to society. And you can do that through um, K through 12 science education, through, uh, through uh, uh, transferring technology to uh, industry, or through third world medicine. And those are all things we're interested in at the Institute. And again, something scientists very, very rarely do is community leadership. The idea that you and your community can make a difference and help create a community that you'd like your children and your grandchildren to live in I think is, uh, is really quite an important idea. So the social implications of the genome sequence. Well, one, uh, I think one of the clearest ideas is that race, races are a cultural artifact. And we just have to accept that and deal with that. For different people, that will mean different kinds of things. But it says there are certain kinds of responsibilities that, that we do have. If we share that common evolutionary origin with other organisms, there are issues of what are our responsibilities toward preserving organisms and, and ecology and the rapidly uh, disappearing diversity and so forth. And finally, of course, there, there isn't all that much diversity in humans. In fact, we're probably the least polymorphic of all species uh, that have been studied in detail anyway. But on the other hand, it is the origin of what makes us unique and different one from another. And this is something we're going to come to understand in enormous detail uh, at uh, all of the different levels. So in closing, let me just say, I think you can begin to see how these five new approaches to biology have kind of come together and leave us where we are today. On the one hand, and for the mathematicians, they've given us a whole set of, of grand challenges in mathematics and computer science that I think are enormously fertile territory for uh, young students to begin exploring. And I think one of the interesting questions is how institutes such as the one 
Well, or, or an interesting question is whether institutes such as the one that you have here are only in the business for education or should you think about setting up deep relationships where you can begin to explore some of these kinds of questions in, in a more effective way. Well, that's it. tremendous amount to think about and bring the manifold questions that maybe we can deal with one or two questions uh, here. Yes. Um, you, you talk about biology as being a digital system because of the DNA being a digital sequence. Right. And, and so then, and the transcription factors that come onto the DNA, well, they were created by their own digital sequences for the genes that encode. Correct. But then actually what they do when they hit the DNA depends a lot on, on how close they are and how they bend the DNA. So then you get all of this analog coming. That's, that's ex See, the interfusion of environmental signals, and I would call transcription factors environmental signals, onto the digital information. How they interface with one another is one of the really deep issues in biology. So you're absolutely right. It's not merely digital, but it's the integration of digital and analog. The only point I made about digital is there are two fundamental kinds of information that are uniquely digital. One are the, the genes, the, the, the sequences of the genes, and the other, the other is the control elements that specify the architecture of the gene regulatory networks. And it is those networks that control physiology and control development. What is really interesting is if we look at a sea urchin, it has all of the same kinds of transcription factors we have. They don't really change. What changes is the architecture of the gene regulatory networks. And that's why I emphasized its digital nature. But when you look at the specifics of how things get done, you do integrate uh, digital and analog types of information. Most of the environment, not all, but most of the environmental information is in fact analog kinds of information. So how do you, can you, can you say a little bit about how the system's biology actually accomplishes that integration? Because I wonder, it, it does kind of seem like you put the digital side up on a pedestal, and then I wonder if that just kind of eviscerates what you're trying to do with the system. Well, in the network I showed you that illustrated how different systems within the yeast actually worked, that was the integration of um, three different kinds of information. RNA concentrations, protein concentrations, protein-protein interactions, and protein-DNA interactions. So that, it's four different types. So that is really a conglomeration of both digital and, and, um, and analog uh, environmental kinds of information. All of the, the networks that we talk about need the integration of both those types of information. I mean, one of the interesting questions in, in, uh, is whether we can develop mining techniques that can look at a genome alone and learn enough about the genes and the control elements so that we can actually guess as to the hardwiring of the gene regulatory and protein networks. And we don't know the answer to that yet. But right now, we can't even begin to do it without experimental perturbations and, and you know, the analog information that you were talking about. So we integrate them both together right from the very, very beginning. Yes? You stressed that one of the outstanding problems is to understand complex networks, and you said that mathematicians might play a role in that. Do um, you see the sort of techniques needed as existing somewhere, primarily being applied to biology, or do you think it takes a whole new viewpoint to understand complex networks? So you have people coming down on both sides of that issue. You, you have people who argue, you know, we can do it all with, uh, you know, the kinds of tools that we have now, differential equations and all those kinds of things. 
I'm really skeptical that we have all the tools, and I'm skeptical. See, we can take in in one of the gene regulatory networks. We've defined a system that has 55 genes in it, 45 of which are these transcription factors, and they're tied together. We know how they're tied together in a very complex pattern. So we've taken one of those genes and we've studied it in enormous detail and we can f formulate NAP that describe it very well across its developmental cycle. But if you think, and, and that's one of the very simplest of the genes in the system, if you think about integrating that behavior with 54 other behaviors I don't know that we have the, the, the mathematics for doing it, I, and I don't pretend to be an expert, but I'm, that's why we feel it's vitally important mathematicians with broad experience come and look at these problems and figure it, I mean, they'll, they'll be the ones that will end up answering the question in the end, I think. Yes? So I have a lot of trouble understanding how this predictive medicine is going to work. I mean, it's almost like asking the meteorologists how to predict where Isabel's going to get the East Coast. They are taking thousands of measurements on it. They don't know where it's going to hit. And because it's such a complicated thing, what's this magic website going to do where you somehow put in your, put in your data? And now somehow some, some data set has to have been compiled and said, well, people with high levels of this and low levels of that and yeah. medium levels of this all sort of... But see, that's already been done for a number of genes, so you just have to do it for a lot more genes. I mean, if you take, for example, a breast cancer 1 gene, if a woman has a single bad copy of that gene, you have a 70% chance of getting breast cancer by the time you're 60 years of age. And those, those statistics are pretty good. And so, so one of the grand challenges is going to be to separate out signal from noise when you have all genes. And there's absolutely no question about that. I think that's going to be very hard. I think we will, there are going to be dominant genes that really stand out there and, and will give us these kinds of probabilities. They all are operated on by other modifying genes and dissecting out their roles and everything is going to be, I think, mathematically far, far more challenging. So, so again, we may need new mathematics to sort out signal from noise and to figure and, and to be able to identify genes that have really minor effects compared to, I mean, what we've done to date is we've looked at genes that have these really major effects and they're, they're admittedly really easy to, um, but you know, what is very interesting is there are women that have this breast cancer one gene that don't get the disease at all. So why is that? Well, there, there are two possibilities, one is there is um, an environmental signal that's needed, or, and I think it's much more likely, the other is their background modifying genes that are necessary to have it manifest its, uh, its, uh, its full pathology. But I do think that the, um, I think we've got a lot more control of the parameters that we can measure in human beings than we do in weather and things like that. But I could be wrong. I mean, we, we could find out in 10 years that this is just unbelievably, and, and of course, if we can't do those early predictions, we still have the other possibility of doing this multi-parameter analysis and learning a lot through that, where we don't even necessarily understand why it's this way, but it is. It's a correlation we've observed. and. That, that cancer as opposed to normal mouse correlation is one of the most striking that we've ever seen. And so there, there are really good multi-parameter techniques that are being developed now to do that kind of thing. Yes? So 
I gave you kind of a trivial explanation. I agree. If I could, you might be able to optimize subdrugs and, and cut down their side effects. A much more likely possibility, in my view, is that we can come to understand the network and its key nodal points in enormous detail so that we might not attack that central thing, but we might do some other thing that's much easier to block and achieve exactly the same kind of effect. And we think if we really understand the networks... I believe you attack A or precursor A. My question is, what about the other ones? Why do they have a million proteins? They are making sure you're going to attack them. So, you know, you know, there are two possibilities. One, you've got the assay, and it isn't one and a half million proteins. It's a finite number of those other systems that were there. But two, the, the other point is, if you use phylogenes, if you use proteins rather than drugs, they're attractive because they've actually been designed to do very specific kinds of things. So that is another kind of possibility, too. But you know, you'll have to use all of those, all of those kind of tricks, I think, to get it. OK. Well, on your way out, let me just mention one thing. You might want to pick out the souvenir poster that I'm going to show you. And uh, you can look at it at the end.